So today we're going to go over George Annis' article, The Prostitute, the Playboy, and the Poet, Rationing Schemes for Organ Transplantation. He first reviews four different approaches, the market approach, selection committees, lotteries, um, and customary approaches. He's going to find all four of these severely lacking and he's going to propose his own. So he thinks that any fair approach to uh, distributing al or allocating scarce resources should balance efficiency, fairness, and respect for human life. So first things first, the candidate um, must you know, want the organ, but then they also must you know, be able to get significant benefit from that. So once we have these objective criteria down, then you know, maybe we would use a lottery system or a um, you know, social worth to determine who gets the organs, but you know, if he's going to find that social worth is arbitrary and lotteries are not going to be fair to people who are in more desperate need. So maybe after reviewing these uh, considerations, a committee might uh, determine who's more in immediate need and you know, move people to the top of the list. But then once that uh, has been determined, then we can distribute the remaining resources and the remaining organs uh, on a first come first serve basis. So this process might not be the most equal, but it's going to be you know, the most flexible. It's going to recognize um, people's immediate needs and it's still going to try and strive for fairness and respect for human life. The medical community started to reckon with rationing scarce resources in Seattle in the 1960s. This started when they had more dialysis uh, patients than they had dialysis machines. Obviously when they first created the dialysis machine that was a, a big issue. So they would, you know, were considering questions like who should go first? You know, should the sickest or the ones with the most potential of recovery? Maybe we should do first come first serve or the most valuable. Um, you know, the ones who have the most dependents, maybe parents uh, should be considered heavier, or women and children. Uh, maybe we should just distribute it based on who can pay. So they started these committees to decide who would get, you know, this life-saving resource. Uh, one committee member ended up coming out and uh, was quoted saying that she voted against someone because they were a prostitute, or uh, another person because they were a playboy. Like, so she explicitly voted against people because of their lifestyle choices. And that might not sound super unreasonable, but then it came out that um, they also voted against candidates because they were creative nonconformists. Um, so these are like poets and artists. Now, I'm not saying I'm an artist, but you know, I like to think this is creative and it's definitely nonconformist. So um, I, I think that, yeah, this is pretty clearly a, a bad criteria to you know, rule someone out as a candidate for organ transplants. So you know, when the public found out, they were pretty righteously upset. Um, and, you know, it's clear how, how the biases were impacting these decisions. So, you know, so we don't have to think about this. Congress passed the law in 1972, which, you know, allowed everyone under Medicaid, Medicare to, um, you know, get dialysis or, you know, transplantation. They were covering it for everyone. So just so we wouldn't have to think about this tough decision. But this merely like postpones the inevitable. Like we're eventually going to have to reckon, like the medical community is going to have to reckon with the, the ra rationing of scarce resources. So it's probably better if we figure out a good scheme and a good system of how to do that before we're in the middle of the situation where we're having to ration it and we're not probably thinking as clearly as we are when we're you know, not having to ration things. So we're going to look at four uh, approaches uh, and then Giannis is going to offer a, a combination of certain uh, ones. It's not Giannis, it's Annis. It's George Annis. Giannis is the basketball player. <laughs> so first we're going to look at the market approach. This is the idea that transplants should be given to those who can pay, either cash or if it's covered by their insurance. We definitely shouldn't be using federal funds to be subsidizing this. But critics are going to point out that the technologies used in the surgeries were developed using federal funds and medical resources uh, for high priority patients might not always be available. So, you know, having enough money isn't going to justify demanding a procedure. 
On top of that, like the idea that the less fortunate have to hold bake sales in order to raise funds to, for life-saving treatments is just demeaning to them. And, you know, Annis is going to claim that it's kind of demeaning to society as a whole. So this approach is uh, going to completely disregard the principle of equality. It's going to suggest that we can place a price on an individual human's life. And on top of that, like the individual is the one who is the, the individual whose life is at stake is the one who is expected to pay for it. And both of those seem like pretty unacceptable. So Annis is going to reject the market approach. So the next approach is the selection committee process. This was developed because just using explicit objective criteria either wasn't working or it was unwise. So if we use this approach, uh, Honest is going to claim that you know it leads to two possibilities. Either the committee is going to fall into a pattern, or the committee is not going to fall into the pattern. If the committee does fall into the pattern, then that pattern could just be codified and used as rules um, that you know we could use without the committee. So it's redundant. Or uh, they're not going to fall into a pattern. Uh, and if they don't fall into a pattern, then the committee could be charged with arbitrariness or with being dishonest. So, you know, Annis is going to say that this approach fails because uh, it involves, you know, the state and people's judgments about people's lives and interests. Um, and yeah, like the market approach, like this approach is going to be undermined by the general devaluing of equality and human life. So the next approach we're going to look at is known as the lottery approach. This is the ultimate equalizer. Everyone's going to have an equal chance regardless of race, color, creed, or financial status. This approach seems to put the principle of equality above everything else. And in so doing, it seems to violate our sense of efficiency and fairness. It doesn't take into account whether the patient even wants it, or their potential to survive, or their quality of life. On top of that, this solution seems to be a lackluster response from people who are unwilling to put in the effort to consider such tough decisions. Um, and such indifference towards human life seems to you know, undermine the idea that we can't put, place a, a price on human life. So, you know, Annis is going to find this approach unacceptable. Now, his first come first serve approach that he's going to propose in a, in a little bit is is like a, a natural lottery in terms of you know the people who get referrals from their doctors and which ones don't or which ones get referred to which clinics. Um, so it's going to create this natural lottery system, but it's also going to have its own problems. So the first come first serve approach is clearly going to advantage higher income groups, people who are more likely to get medical care in the first place, and people who are likely to get the referrals from their doctors. So the next approach we're going to look at is known as the customary approach. This is the idea that doctors should be choosing based on their customs or traditions. But when people frame the decisions that they're making in terms of you know, who's going to die because it's just too expensive, the public you know, finds this unacceptable. So for instance, uh, you know, Britain, in Great Britain, there was a tradition amongst uh, general practitioners not to refer patients over 55 for dialysis. But then there was a study done in 1984 that showed the rates of new and sage kidney treatment in Britain was 40 per 1 million, as opposed to in the US where it was 80 per 1 million, so double in the United States. They estimated that this results in 1,500 to 3,000 unnecessary deaths per year. And it's like, yeah, when the public finds out, they're not you know, happy about this, especially when it's because we you know, don't have enough money, we're, un we're being too cheap. So, you know, when the public found out uh, in Great Britain, they decided to enlarge the national health services to meet this need. And this is generally considered the more, you know, morally acceptable, um, you know, choice. In the U.S., the customary approach is to select patients on medical criteria and clinic suitability. But this is going to implicitly rely on um, evaluations of individual social worth. So it's implicit. So you know, think about it like this. For example, one of the criteria is family support after care. So this is going to discriminate against people who you know don't have families or maybe are alienated from their families. And this might be relevant, but is it strictly speaking medical as the criteria supposes? 
Other standards that have been used have been, you know, IQ, mental illness, criminal records, employment, indulge, uh, indigence, alcoholism, drug addiction, uh, and geographic location. Um, age is another one that's a little bit trickier, so it might be a good, you know, criteria that we can use, but at the same time, like, not all 49-year-olds are going to be better candidates than a 50-year-old. So, you know, without any justification for a clear cutoff line, it seems like choosing any age is going to be arbitrary and it's going to, you know, devalue the lives of the elderly. So, Annis is going to claim that uh, this reasoning can also be extended to justify the inclusion of alcoholics and drug addicts in the pool of candidates for uh, organ transplants. So one advantage of the customary approach is that it makes it look as if we're not choosing. But the disadvantage is that this is only an illusion. Um, you know, when people find out that, you know, the doctors are the ones who are choosing and they're using these implicit social worth evaluations, uh, they're going to be upset. And so either we are going to have to give everyone universal access to this, which is what we decided to do with dialysis, or we are going to have to find another way of selecting, making these selections. So now we're going to go over Giannis's approach. He calls this a combination approach. Um, but first he's going to set some criteria. So uh, he thinks that a, a socially acceptable approach to rationing scarce medical resources should be one that's fair, efficient, and it reflects important social values. So clearly the social values here are going to be fairness itself, equality, and valuing human life. And efficiency here is going to mean, you know, giving organs to people who want them, but also people who are likely to receive significant benefit from them. So it's going to be a two-step process. First, we're going to, you know, use this initial screening process using exclusive, exclusively medical criteria. So social worth is probably going to creep in in some aspects. It's entire. It's impossible to completely disentangle the two. Um, so you know, co poor are like more likely to have comorbidities such as uh, diabetes, uh, hepatitis, or hypertension, which are going to make them less desirable candidates, um, and also more expensive to treat. So to prevent this widening gap between the rich and the poor, we need to develop objective medical criteria. Um, that are going to try and be independent of this social worth. One way to ensure this is to have the uh, medical screening, the criteria approved by an ethics committee with a significant public representation and make these criteria available for the public to comment on. So this process is still not going to be enough. As I said, there's, there's two steps. That was round one. That process is not going to be enough. The demand is still going to be higher than the supply. So we're still going to need to select who's going to get the organs from the eligible candidates. So kidneys are going to be slightly different than livers and hearts uh, in a couple different ways, but uh, you know, so this matching program is going to be slightly more so sophisticated. Um, but an important difference is that patients can remain on dialysis until they get a really, really good match. Um, so since organs are matched on size, tissue, and distributed you know, who's closest to them, or who's the closest match, this kind of creates this little natural lottery. So we're still, you know, going to have to decide who's going to get these organs, um, you know, so he says there's, there's two ways we can approach this. We can either use a, a value-laden social criteria, um, or we can just be selecting at random. Well, you know, the arbitrariness and the unacceptability of social worth is going to make it neither a viable nor a proper method. And choosing at random also seems to be uh, unreasonable. So uh, consider this, for example, you know, we have patient A and patient B. So patient A has a one in four chance of living five years with a kidney and can survive for another six months on dialysis. Patient B has the same prospects of life, one in four chance of living five years with a new kidney. Uh, but this person can only survive another few days or hours on dialysis. So it seems like, you know, if we were to just choose at random and patient A is the one who gets the transplant, it seems like that's kind of unfair to patient B. So maybe there's like a reasonable combination uh, of going on here so we can maybe uh, allocate the organs on a first come first serve to the members on the approved list. 
but then we can also let some members jump the uh, jump to the top of the list using the the selection committee. So the selection committee has to decide, uh, you know, who's going to be in the most immediate danger, who's uh, going to possibly uh, die. Uh, but then they also have to have a prospect of long-term survival with the transplant. So this method of the, the first come, first serve combinational approach the, uh, that Annis is getting at here or proposing here um, is going to approximate the, the randomness of a straight lottery, but it's not just going to hold equality as the only value. Um, this might be a little bit unfair still. You know, rich people are going to get on the list quicker, and so they're going to be higher up on the list. Uh, but the more we make the public aware of this, the less inequality there, there's going to be here. So there's also some unfairness uh, with people jumping the line, but you know the, the flexibility ensures that organs aren't going to be distributed randomly and we're going to be able to give organs to those in the most need. Still medical resources are likely to be limited um, and so some quality candidates, some qualified candidates are you know going to die before they receive a transplant. So maybe there's maybe more ways of reducing the, the list. Um, we could possibly create the, a stricter medical criteria you know, let, admit less people into the pool. Or maybe we can increase the uh, resources devoted to transplants and organ procurement. Um, and three, uh, individuals can be persuaded not to join the pool. So the second one sounds nice uh, when we can, you know, grow organs or something like that. Maybe we, we won't have to make these decisions. And, you know, maybe we uh, could use stricter criteria, but it seems like we're already using pretty strict criteria and anything else we use is probably going to be very value laden and um, so something we're not going to want. So number three here is going to be the only option we're really going to have. It's the only one that's going to be able to conserve a scarce resource while also respecting individuals' autonomy. But you know, why wouldn't someone want to get a transplant? Um, you know, there are a lot of burdens associated with a transplant. The daily regimen of immunosuppression systems, uh, medicines, uh, periodic and periodical checkups for uh, rejection symptoms. So, you know, the idea is to publicize the, the risks and burdens associated with this and, you know, maybe it's going to encourage some people not to uh, join the, the transplant list, the wait list. But, you know, most people are going to want to and that's cool, it's totally their right, um, they probably should. Um, but, you know, if some people don't, then that's, that's a fine thing. So this third option is just trying to inform people. It's not trying to actually persuade people not to do, uh, not to take care of themselves or, or um, their medicine. So decisions about life-saving treatment and who's going to be condemned to die are tough decisions that the medical community is going to have to make. And using certain criteria to make these decisions can give us the illusions that the methods we're using are morally acceptable. But when the public find out that those are the criteria they're using, they tend to get upset. So a method used to decide how to ration scarce medical resources is one that should be fair and efficient and, you know, value human uh, values. If they're not fair and efficient, uh, then we're probably going to go from one approach to another, continuing the illusion that we're not having to make these tough choices. But really, we should be moving towards a system that, you know, has quality access and quality service uh, to the patients. Um, but it also is able to contain costs without, you know, uh, challenging our value of human life. So Honest is going to conclude uh, that we should all, you know, be involved in developing approaches in how to ration these scarce medical resources that we can't live without. All right, so I want you guys to think about, you know, what what criteria do you think should be used? Uh, if, if we are allowed to use social worth, you know, which ones are morally acceptable? Are we, should we be allowed to exclude alcoholics from liver transplants? Should we be allowed to exclude, um, you know, drug addicts, uh, things like that? Uh, think about what criteria do you think should be used? Uh, what about, you know, after, uh, after care? So if you don't have families, is that, should that be, you know, drop you down further on the list? So think about this, you know, what, what do you think is a fair, efficient uh, way of deciding how to ration these scarce medical resources that is not going to compromise our value of human life? All right, I'll see you guys in class.